Hello and welcome to the Cat Knits podcast. I'm Kat or Catherine and I live in Vancouver, Canada. This is my monthly podcast where I chat about all the knitting that I've been up to in the past month. So I talk about my finished objects, works in progress, and then any kind of things that I've picked up or purchased that relate to knitting. So this past month, uh, actually my husband and I, we went to New York and I got to go to Rhinebeck for the first time, as well as we were there visiting friends and then um, family came out as well. And while I was at Rhinebeck, I managed to purchase a little bit. I'll talk about my first experience at Rhinebeck at the end and then go over some of the yarny and goodness that I purchased. I also went to a couple of fabric stores in New York, so I'll share those purchases as well. Based on the size, the amount of stuff that's sitting on this couch beside me, I think it's going to be a bit of a longer episode. So hope you kind of have maybe something to keep you warm and cozy, maybe a cup of tea or a hot chocolate or a coffee and perhaps a little bit of uh, knitting as that's my favorite thing to do when watching a knitting podcast is get a couple rows in on a project. Okay, so I'll just dive in without further ado. So as you can see, I am wearing a sweater that I talked about last time and I finished it. My goal was to wear this uh, to one of the dates for Rhinebeck and I got to do it. Rhinebeck was cold and rainy, so it was great for sweaters. So I've talked about this a fair amount, but this is the Guernsey Genzer by Sandes Garn. It is included in the Soft Knits for Women book. I purchased this at a local yarn store in Vancouver. There's still quite a few at yarn stores. You can't purchase this online individually, the pattern. And here is a better shot of what it looks like. So this is knit. The suggested yarn is a DK held together with a mohair, but I chose to go with a worsted weight instead. I didn't have any problems getting gauge. I used the same needle, needle size with this worsted weight yarn and I got the correct number of stitches. The yarn that I chose to use was this yarn actually. It's the Cumbria by the Fiberco and it is a non super wash Marsham wool merino mohair blend and I use the color Saddleback Slate. So there is, I would say mine does differ a little bit than the one that the model has on. And that is mainly, I think, due to my yarn choice. So because I chose a non superwash yarn, it doesn't have the level of drape that this sweater does. Like, as you can see, the drop shoulder is quite a big drop. It almost goes down to her elbow, I would say. But for me, the drop shoulder is kind of, you know, high upper arm. And I really like this. I did I did want it to be a little less oversized than what is shown in this picture. So I'm really happy with this yarn choice. This is my oopsies, my swatch. And I actually originally purchased this yarn in a white color because I wanted to copy the pattern and how they had done it. So I ended up doing my first swatch in the white and then I ended up doing the white with a mohair. The reason being is I just didn't love the way the white yarn looked. I think it's very traditional to do this kind of almost like worsted weight sweater in a white, like you see a lot of white cable knits. And so when I saw the swatch, I realized it just looked a little too traditional for me, what I kind of like to wear. I just also didn't think that it really highlighted kind of the beauty of the yarn. To me, it, it honestly just looked a little cheap. I hate to say it, but wasn't, it didn't give off the vibe that I was hoping for. So that's where I tried with the mohair, but I still didn't love it. And then when I switched to a darker color, that's when I fell in love with the yarn and with the way it looked. It's a very soft yarn. I don't have any problems with this itching me. It's definitely very warm and toasty. I've been basically living in this sweater for a couple weeks now and it is starting to pill, but I don't think that's unreasonable. I, th I, I think when you're using a 100% wool that doesn't have any 
um, acrylic or, you know, nylon in it. I think it's more natural that it's going to pill. So the pilling doesn't bother me, but I think you might be able to see um, the pills here. And I do just kind of pick them off. I'm not sure if that's also because it's got mohair in it. So then it makes it um, have a bit more of a halo. There you go. <laughs> just cleaning my sweater as I'm here. Why not? I ended up, this sweater only comes in three sizes, so I ended up making the largest slot, uh, the smallest size, sorry, which was a small medium. And since I got gauge, it is roughly how big it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be oversized. I ended up using almost all of six balls of the Cumbria wool. So this is the amount that I had left over. If you'd been following me, I would have mentioned how scared I was of running out of yarn, but this I think is almost half a ball of yarn. So each sleeve required about three quarters of a ball and then the body required four. So I have about half a ball left over, which is fantastic. It's a top down sweater. So you end up uh, creating this like back panel. It's a back rectangle actually. And then you pick up on either side of the rectangle and you do a little bit of short rows for just some shaping. And then you end up knitting quite a bit and then increasing a little bit around the neck and then you cast on to join the front. And then you knit both the, the back and the front before joining the back and the front underneath kind of the arms and then knitting in the round all the way down. And then you pick up for the sleeves and then knit downwards so it was it's great i love a top down sweater because then you can try it on as you go also the neckline is picked up and then it's uh folded over and i think a picked up neckline in this case is really great because it just adds a little bit more structure i'm not sure why but when you kind of start with the neck and then go down like when the neck is connected to the stitches in the body it tends to kind of drag the sweater more Whereas when you pick up the stitches, it has like a little more strength and a little more structure to the garment, especially because the sweater is so heavy. Like I said, it's almost 650 gram, 650 gram, 600 grams, around 550, which is I think almost a pound. Cause I think it's 2.2 kilograms. So I think it's a pound, like over a pound. So it's, it's a heavy sweater. And that's one of the reasons why I like that I've used a non superwash because it just has that little bit more of that bounce to it, has a little bit more structure. I did block this and it didn't expand or kind of lose its shape. It's really managed to stay together. In fact, you can still see a little bit like the ridges where I've got this garter stitch ribbing between the panels and you can really still see the like difference in tension which maybe isn't ideal, but it just, it's the strength of the yarn to really have a memory and keep its shape, which has, you know, pros and cons. But overall, I, th I think it's, I think it's awesome. Uh, so it's got three major panels of different textures in it. And then it ends with a nice big amount of two by two ribbing. I love the thick rib at the bottom and on the sleeves. The sleeves actually have this fourth panel and this is like a one by one seed stitch, I think it is. And this is where in the sweater they recommend that you control the length of the sleeves. So these follow the sections on the body exactly. Although you are doing decreases uh, throughout the sleeve, not a heck of a lot, but uh, a fair amount and then you do like six or seven degreases right before doing the ribbing for the wrist. And then this is where, so I ended up modifying the pattern a bit just because I didn't want the sleeves to be quite as long. Like I think from the pattern here, which I'll show you the photo again, the sleeves are very long and I didn't want them to be that long. So I ended up cutting down on the number of rows in the one by one seed stitch. So I think I did nine, I can't remember if it's like 16 or something that they recommend. 
I basically went until I thought I had a big enough chunk that it would still look okay because obviously I didn't want to get rid of all of it or else it would it would have been too short and I didn't want to do it too small or else I think it would have looked awkward to have all these kind of big panels and then all of a sudden there'd be just a panel that was like three rows long before doing this kind of like three sections of three garter ridge bumps so I, yeah, I ended up doing nine and I think that worked out great. I did want the sleeves to be oversized. One thing I noticed when I was wearing my uh, cumulus blouse, which I just finished last month, is I definitely made the sleeves too short. When I'm trying on the sweaters and I've got the sleeves, I almost like hold my body up like this and I've got my arm right down to my side. And then I'm looking to see if it's long enough. And then I try to hit, you know, just after the wrist bone. But the reality is, is when you're wearing a sweater, you know, you're going to be doing things like you're going to be like when you're driving, you got your arms up. And then when you're doing things, you're kind of moving around and it pulls the sweater up your body. And I realized after I was doing things that the sweater was riding up my sleeves. So I've taken a new approach when measuring my sleeves, which is rather than standing like a little robot and wondering if I can get the sleeve length right, I'm going to actually bend my elbows and see if I like the sleeve length when I'm moving and maybe even like do something in the kitchen, like make a cup of tea and then see how I feel about the sleeve length rather than just kind of standing. I think part of it is I want to be done the sleeves. So the opportunity to end faster always seems like a great idea. You know, just I want to just get to the long enough point before being able to bind off and move on to the next sleeve but I'm definitely gonna go back to my cumulus blouse and rip out the eye cord and add back a couple like I would say half an inch to an inch to the sleeves um APT Atelier which is another knitting youtuber that I really like she's doing this fall make along where you go back to your old knits and you kind of fix them and update any changes so that you can wear them so I was thinking about participating uh, this month in November and fixing that and then I'll I'll wear it and I'll show the difference I know um, someone mentioned that they'd love to see me actually wearing the sweater standing up so I'll do that once I fix the sleeves in the next episode as well so um yeah I kind of talked about the construction so this is a small medium and I talked about the yarn sorry I kind of went off on a tangent there and now I've uh, forgotten my place but yeah the sweater, I absolutely love it. I can see it being a huge staple in my wardrobe. I'm a huge fan of pullovers. I love where the neck sits naturally. Like to me, it's just the right amount of space between my um, like my collarbone and my neck. I love things that are actually really close, like a tight fitted crew neck. So for me, this collar is absolutely perfect. I ended up using the petite knit or the technique that I learned from petite knit when doing the folded over collar which is where you kind of you know you do the length that they suggest and then on that last row you bind off while stitching it down so that you don't have to seam it so basically with every you kind of line up so that you're exactly um, picking up a stitch on the inside you're picking up the same stitch that's on your needle like at the at the root of where you picked up stitches so you uh, pick up that stitch on at the root, at the base, and then you knit two together. And then, so you knit that stitch that's on your needle and then the stitch that you picked up that's on the root. So you knit two together. Then you just knit one as usual on your actual uh, collar that you're doing. And then you bind off that other stitch by slipping it over, just the traditional bind off. And then again, you would pick up a stitch and knit it together with a stitch that's already on your needles. And then you, you bind off that other stitch. So you're only picking up every other stitch and then you're binding off as you go. And it just, it's super quick. You don't have to worry about seaming, which is quite possibly one of my least favorite knitting techniques is seaming. So you avoid that. It has the right amount of stretch to it because you're only picking up every other stitch and yeah, I think that's my new go-to for a folded over, folded over collar. Um, all the edging has tubular bind off. 
I was a little disappointed to learn that tubular bind off in two by two rib is really just, you just transition to a one by one bind off. So you just switch the location of the knits and the purl stitches that you have knit one purl one, knit one purl one, which doesn't create quite as clean of an edge. It kind of just looks a little muddled at the end, honestly. And it also causes the um, knit stitches to kind of like, like the end just looks a little bit like at the top, the stitches go like this because you've now swapped the knit stitches to be one stitch over. So it, it makes sense. It's too bad that that's how you do the tubular bind off for two by two rib. I didn't realize that. I didn't look into alternatives, but maybe that's something. Next time I have a two by two bind off and I want to do something like a tubular, maybe there's another way to get that same look as a one by one without having to kind of Frankenstein your two by two. Um, in terms of other modifications, I don't think I really modified much when it came to this pattern. Like I said, I got gauge, so I just kind of ran with it. Of course, I made some mistakes and I had to, you know, tinker back for the sleeve. I ended up picking up stitches in the opposite direction. And by that point I had given up. So I just ended up doing a short row to like turn it around so that I would be knitting um, on the correct side. I did end up using my favorite underarm technique, which I have done for every sweater, which is by Susan B. Anderson. So I keep all, I everything I mention, I try to write down in the notes. Please let me know if I did miss anything. I'll include the link to this YouTube video for doing the holes and underarms. But the basic idea is that you pick up an extra stitch on either side. So you kind of typically when you do an underarm, you have those stitches that you picked up. Then you might have some stitches on rest, like kind of right underneath the armpit. And so these stitches that you picked up to the stitches on rest, there's like almost a little hole that naturally happens. So you pick up a stitch, an extra stitch in this hole, then you, and you do that for e either side of these stitches that are on rest. And then the first round, you end up um, doing a knit two together through the back loop that like kind of twists that stitch and adds it to another one, which really just kind of closes that hole. I love that technique. I use it for baby sweaters and adult sweaters and it's been a lifesaver. I've now, like I used to have holes in my underarms and I'd have to go back and stitch it up. And now I, I don't have that problem. I actually haven't woven in the ends on the sweater. I did weave in the ends for the two wrists because that made the most sense, but I have still, let me see if I can find them. I've still got all the ends everywhere else. So I haven't even fixed up these underarms and woo woo, I think they're, I think they're looking good. So that is a technique to keep and to use in your toolbox. If you've always kind of been like me and frustrated with the underarms of your sweaters. Okay, I feel like I've talked about that sweater for like 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll move on. So. I cast on this sweater in February. I tend to kind of go through phases. So I cast on a bunch of sweaters and then it takes me like six to eight months to finish them. So I cast this one on in February and then I finished it in October. And last episode, I the sweater I cast on was also cast on in February and I finished it last month in September. And then I had a sweater that I finished, I believe in August that I had also cast on. In September. So right now I'm doing my massive sweater cast on again. I've started two other sweaters and then I have another one that I've already mentioned before that I'm going to purchase. But I actually realized I have one more kind of finished object. So this is, I kind of briefly mentioned this. So as I said, I went to New York for two weeks, which is such a treat and I wanted to have a plain knitting project. So while I was on the plane, I managed to finish this glove and then get this far on another one. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but there was a little problem. And that is I ran out of the mohair. I can't believe it. So I mentioned last time that this was the leftover yarn from my Oslo hat, which I did in an adult medium. I did the Oslo hat with mohair edition by Petite Knit. I 
love that hat. It's currently actually at a yard store that I worked at being used as a sample, so I don't have it here to show you. But I thought, what a great idea, but to knit uh, Tin Can Knits World Simplest Mittens with the leftover yarn. So I weighed my yarn to make sure I would have enough yardage. And I did for the fingering weight yarn, but I never weighed the mohair. I just figured mohair has so much length. It's like so light. How could I ever, how could mohair be the problem? I'm gonna run out of the, the fingering, but unfortunately I, I ran out of the mohair and not like kind of close to finishing, but basically at the beginning of the second glove. So this yarn is the Tough Love Sock by Sweet Georgia. And then I was holding their Silk Mist, which is a mohair silk yarn, lace weight yarn. And they're both in the same colors. I think it's cauldron. I'll make sure to have that correct uh, in the show notes below. I ended up doing the, I believe I did the DK pattern. So I typically, when I hold a mohair with a any sort of yarn, I kind of bump up roughly the um, the weight of the thicker yarn. So for instance, when I did the sweater, I, it was supposed to be a DK with a fingering and I kind of found a worsted weight, which worked out. And then for this, it was a fingering with a mohair and so I ended up doing a DK. So just kind of you go up one one yarn size. Also, I learned that DK stands for double knitting. Not sure if you knew that. I didn't know that. Fun fact. So this pattern was a lot of fun. This is the world's simplest mittens and they are simple. I, of course, I was knitting these. You start at the cuff, you do the ribbing, then you do some increases for the thumb. Then you put some stitches on hold and then you just knit all the way down before doing a decrease and then binding off at the at the the tip of the fingers. I of course though when I got all the way to the very end and I was doing my decreases, I was like, oh weird, the stitches the stitch number that they want me to end up with, I can't end up with that because I don't have the right number of stitches. So then I went back and I counted how many stitches I had cast on originally, and I had cast on two less than what I was supposed to. <laughs> Goodness me. This is a free pattern, and I actually ended up using the Tin Can Knits app. They just created the app, and it has this huge update, which allows you to view uh, a pattern just with your size and your desired uh, measurements. So like, well, I guess, is that measurements? Um, units. So I got to choose metric and then adult small size for my gloves and then DK weight. Tin Can Knits is great because a lot of their patterns, they actually do them in almost all the weights of yarn. So you can really knit anything, any size with their patterns, which is fantastic. And this app allows you to really kind of hone in on exactly what you're looking for. So you can just concentrate on that. Now, despite that, I still managed to cast on the wrong number of stitches, but that's just, that's just me. I tend to make mistakes in my knitting and it works out. These fit great, I'll try one on. So like I said, I followed the instructions. I did not unfortunately pack a measuring tape on the plane. So I just had to roughly try to do, they recommend, I think it was seven centimeters. So I just kind of had to guess what I thought was seven centimeters. I haven't measured it to see how good I was at guessing. And then I followed the instructions. And then for anything that had to do with length, I just was trying the glove on. So in terms of like how long the thumb should be, I was just trying it on. And then I knew that I was going to um, the thumb. You go through all the stitches, all the empty, um, you do like knit two together for the last round. And then you pull the yarn through the rest of the live stitches and you pull it tight to kind of create that like, you know, closing. They recommend doing the same for the tip of the glove, but I ended up doing a Kitchener bind off just because I thought, which is typically done at the toe of socks, just because I thought it would be a little bit cleaner. But when I did that, I realized that it was um, a little bit 
loose or like holy, like I could kind of see my finger poking through, possibly because I did it too short, who knows? But what I ended up doing is I did the Kitchener and then I went through all the stitches like I did for the thumb. So I went through like, you know, the six or eight stitches that were at the top and I just kind of pulled it through just to kind of make it a little bit more, uh, a tighter, a tighter finish at the top. So like I said, I kind of knit to the length and then when I had about, this looks like about one and a half centimeters left that I wanted for my fingers, then I started doing the decreases. And I think, I think it really did work out pretty well. I was pretty conservative with trying to reduce yarn. That's why I did it this way because I knew that I was going to maybe run out of yarn. I think I had like six extra yards in the fingering weight yarn. Little did I know that the real problem wasn't the fingering weight yarn, but the mohair. So here you can see the second one. I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do. I kind of need to take a bit of a break from buying yarn. I've been, you know, with going to Rhinebeck, I just, I think I need a little bit of a break for the next couple months, like until Christmas, until the new year. I've got lots of yarn and projects, so I think I'm going to put this on hold. I haven't yet decided if I'm going to purchase another mohair yarn so that I will have matching glove and hats for the new year. Or possibly what I might do is rip out this glove and this and then just knit it in the uh, fingering weight yarn because I think I definitely will have enough of that based on how much this glove weighed and how much I have left here. I, I love this pattern. It was very quick to knit up. Like I want to say I did this whole glove. Oh, I don't want to put it. Anyways, I think this was like less than like a week worth of knitting in the evenings. I think you could almost get a whole pair done in one week uh, if you were if you were determined. I think it would be very possible. It's kind of a cute, it's too bad that it didn't work out because it would have been kind of cute if you knew with one skein of each if you could get a pair of mitts, a pair of adult small mitts and a pair of adult medium hat. That'd be kind of cool out of one, out of two skeins of yarn. So unfortunately that did not happen. So possible idea I have is my dad loves mitts, so I could buy like another mohair and sock weight and then make my dad a pair of mitts and then we'd have matching mitts. In fact, I could make mitts for the whole family in this color. I do love this color a lot, but for now, I'm just going to hold off on it and think about what the next course of action is. I've got lots of other knitting that I can do. And if I do want to do a Christmas gift, I'm pretty confident that I'd be able to knit this through the month of December. So I think November, I'm just going to try to stay out of the yarn stores. We'll see. That's always the goal. And then different things happen. But you can see this is what happens when you have a superwash yarn. So this is a I've used Sweet Georgia yarns in the past and I absolutely love them. This is their Tough Love Sock. So it's a 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon, I believe. And I've made, I can't remember if I've made two. I've definitely made two pairs of socks with it. Whether or not I've made three or four, I can't quite remember. And then of course I've made the hat and now I've made the gloves. It's hand dyed in, the company itself is actually in Vancouver, Canada. It's a great, Great sock yarn. It's bouncy. Or I wouldn't know if it's a bouncy might not be the right word, but it's like thick and soft. And the colors I think are vibrant and beautiful. And I really do love this, this cauldron. It's like a very dark kind of moody gray with hints of almost like it's like, I'd say it's a warm, a warm gray. So it's got almost like bits of purple in it. Although purple sounds like a, maybe a cool color. So maybe it's a cool gray. Really, I mean, look how cute those mitts are. Adorable. Definitely, if you're looking for a Christmas gift knit, I would recommend this. So this is not quite a finished object, but I'm finished with it for now. <laughs> so it's like, it's a new kind of finished object. The object that you're just done working on, don't want to think about anymore and taking a break from. So I'll keep you updated with what I decide to do with my one and a half gloves. The other option is I could 
riff this out and then just make smaller mitts, like mitts for a kid with the leftover mohair. It would just be so sad to rip out a whole entire glove, but I think I could handle it. I'm tough. And knitting is all about gaining patience through making mistakes, in my opinion. That's been like my biggest takeaway over the last few years is having an acceptance for all the little mistakes that happen, kind of enjoying the process as much as enjoying the finished object. And part of that is just realizing that things don't work out as you're planning and there is a solution. It's just trying to figure out what solution you'd rather, which solution you'd prefer the best. And I'm not quite sure yet for this project, what solution I want to go with, buying more yarn, ripping it out, making a smaller one and time will tell. I just realized I looked over and I saw, I bought these uh, gourds at the supermarket. So they had this lovely squash section and I thought it would be fun for the first kind of fall episode to have a couple gourds. I originally was gonna get the non-edible decorative gourds, but then I realized why not get the ones that you can eat? They're just as pretty and then I can cook with them over the month. So I ended up getting a butternut squash, an acorn squash, and a delictia, I think it's called. I typically don't cook with a lot of squash, but I absolutely love it. And I'm gonna try out a couple new recipes with that squash. So anyways, that's my cute little fall, fall thing. So last time I mentioned this sweater, which is the Sally cardigan, I actually ended up getting out my iPad to be a little more high tech and now have the photos in color, which make it a little prettier. So this is by Alex Bird, and it is a cardigan, which you steek, and it's got this traditional Estonia, Estonia technique that you can see on the sleeves. It's called like room, roomy, I think it's called. And then around the, the base or the bottom rib, there's actually a braid as well as this kind of beautiful color work, uh, single stranded color work kind of thing in the, in the ribbing of the sweater. So last time I talked about starting, or I guess I just talked about my swatch and now I've actually started it. So I will show you that. So for that, I am doing, um, two different yarns. One is this beautiful, it's a Shetland BFL blend. It's from a small, farm in the lower mainland so it's only about two hours away there's you know not very many sheep but they produce gorgeous yarns we did a pop-up at the star store that i worked at which is called urban yarns and i ended up um, falling in love with this yarn and purchasing it it's from forge and fiber so it's a canadian it's another canadian yarn um absolutely love it it is a little bit more on the pricey end here. I'm looking at it, it was uh, $40 a skein. So I, I got three of these to be able to knit the sweater. And I was very lucky that when I did my gauge swatch, I got gauge. So this is the main color and this is kind of what it's gonna look like. The great thing about this sweater is once I've finished doing the top section, it's just going to be a lot of stockinette when I do the body. So um, once I finish kind of the top yoke, it's a top down sweater, then I'll just be knitting all that in the round. So it is a steaked sweater, so which means I get to knit in the round rather, rather than back and forth, which uh, is not nearly as much fun. I did have my little swatch here, but now I can't see it anywhere. Ooh, okay, <laughs> it was there. It was just hidden underneath some of the piles of purchases. So here is a swatch when I did it in the round with the two colors that I chose. So all the detailing, so this is done with a fingering weight yarn, the, the, the body, I guess the weight of the sweater is a fingering weight yarn and it is knit on itty bitty needles. It is knit on US two and a half, which I think is three millimeters. All I know is that it's gonna be, it's gonna be a tough one. It's gonna be a time consuming one. Yeah, it's three, three millimeters. So for the color work itself, I chose a fingering weight yarn 
And for that, I chose Woolstock Light, which is a Blue Sky Fibers yarn. I have always wanted to try knitting with their yarns. So the, blue, the Woolstock Light is a single ply, and I believe it's 100% non-superwash wool. Yeah, it's a 100% fine Highland wool. It's got quite a good halo to it. And since it is single ply, um, the halo really, really does shine. I got these two colors, which I absolutely love. I just think they're so vibrant. They also, the beautiful thing about these yarns is they have quite a bit of depth to them. So this kind of limey yellow green has little bits of kind of like a darker color wound through. And then this kind of deep purple raspberry has a blue yarn run through, so which gives it just like a little bit of color depth and beauty. They're quite soft. They do have quite a bit of a halo, which is gonna create a bit of a fuzzy look. I'm not quite sure yet how I feel about it, how it's gonna wear over time. And it's quite contrasting to the BFL Shetland wool. That's the main color, like it has no halo and is pretty good stitch definition, whereas, uh, oops, run away yarn, whereas this has a strong halo, so it doesn't have as good stitch definition. When you're doing the that technique, you end up holding the yarn double. So you, you do use this um, Woolstock Light is a fingering weight yarn as well, which makes sense because then when you're doing the ribbing details, you're gonna be holding the yarn single. So it'll be the same weight as the main color of the body. So this is, I, I mean, I've talked about this before. So it was a fascination to me though, just the difference in superwash versus non-superwash. Like look at how stuck this yarn is to the cake versus when I was showing the Sweet Georgia yarn. Oopsies, that flying yarn. Like this one's just so much more of a natural mess, but this is softer and you can wash this in the machine. Whereas this is scratchier and this is definitely more delicate because it's got the Shetland in it, which is a very weak yarn. It's considered the softest yarn, I believe, of all the English sheep, which you would think that's saying much, but it's not really because the English sheep aren't exactly known for being that soft. So it is more of a rustic wool, but it it looks, the nice thing I like about this is it also looks kind of rustic. So it's, I believe what they've done is they have, it's undyed and because they're mixing the BFL with the Shetland, they, it creates this kind of depth to the yarn where you've got this heathering that naturally happens because you have two yarns that are spun together from two different sheeps that are undyed. So for progress, so I ended up working on this for one week and let me show you how far that I got. I think it's, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's embarrassing. It's not, it's just a little discouraging. So I had one week to work on this. And this is how far I got. I don't know about you, but this is gonna take me forever. <laughs> so if you're if you're like, man, I really want to see what you know, I'm just here to see what this sweater turns out to be, I would say hit the subscribe button and then wait until I'm wearing this in the thumbnail and then that's the episode uh, that you should watch because honestly I think I mean when I look at this it just makes me laugh because I think I've done you know I think I mean that is about three inches but this is how much I've done in a week so yeah it's gonna take me months like I I would bet that I'm gonna have this done for next next fall I would think if I get this done for the end of winter, like for the end of April, I'd be impressed, which is six six months away, especially because I easily get distracted and I love getting distracted with other small projects. I do think though with the nature of this one, since it is stockinette, this is gonna be a great project that I can really, whenever I don't have time to think or just wanna knit, then this is the project that I'm gonna lean towards because I can just kind of pick it up and put it down whenever 
versus some of the other projects, which I'll, I'll share and chat about later on. So one, a couple of things that I really love so far about this design. One is what you end up doing is you, the first part you end up knitting back and forth. So it's a top down raglan sweater. You knit back and forth without joining in the round for quite a few rounds. And that adds the short rope shaping, which I thought was pretty smart. The other thing I really like about the sweater is the fact that the raglan isn't going to just be a simple every other round, you know, make make stitches on each four points of the raglan. It actually has shaping to it. So at the point that I'm at right now, it is just the every other round of the increases. But for all the different sizes, uh, Alex Bird has gone through and trying to figure out what um, kind of curve your raglan should have. So later on in the pattern, I will end up doing different um, like increases only in certain spots to create more of a, a fit to my body. I did notice that um, from the picture, the it is a bit of a deep raglan. I, I tend to, no, I'm not a big fan of that kind of bat wing look. So I'm going to try this on quite a bit and then quite possibly uh, stop the raglan a bit earlier. And then what I would do, what I think I'm going to do is just ca cast on more stitches under the arms so that I have the correct uh, body of the sweater. It's just that I'll be adding more stitches underneath each underarm rather than having them already there from all the raglan increases. That is my, my current plan. We'll see what, what happens. Like I said, this sweater is steaked, so this is the beginning. There is one purl stitch that marks the steak and then these stitches here. It's a three stitch steak, which is going to be roughly the width of the um, the button band. I think the button band will be a maybe actually the button band might be twice as big, but I'll be I'll try this on as I go once I've got a little more done like right now. It's just, it's it's the beginning. It's still very much in the beginning. As you can see, I've started doing the roomy though technique and this technique is a lot of fun. It is, it's basically just weaving the stitches, the yarn in and out. She's got great tutorials on how to do it. And the surprising thing to me is how clean the back looks. So that's the back of the work. Like look at how little yarn, like there's such little floats. In the back, all the floats are on the front, which is great because then your fingers aren't gonna get caught in any of the fabric, which I thought that was surprising. It's kind of cool because you, you carry the yarn this way, you weave it in and out of your stitches as you go this way. And then when you go back, rather than like bringing the yarn back so that you always have that float all the way across when you start again, you actually do this technique where you like loop the yarn and then you're like, as you knit this way, you're knitting with this loop of yarn rather than the body, and then you can like pull it tight to move the yarn back over here. Her video explains it a lot better than I ever could. So I'd recommend checking that out if you're curious. The yarn is feeling great, and I'm very I'm very happy with it. It's fun. I've already been knitting this at night, and it's it's very satisfying and easy to keep track of. This technique is very manageable. I would recommend it. Although it looks intimidating, it, it really isn't. It's probably a great starter to doing color work because you have to follow a chart, but it doesn't quite have the same complexity as color work, I would say, because you don't have to worry about tension as much. And it just seems a little bit more forgiving when you make mistakes and more manageable. And it's a totally different look. So I'm excited to see how to try it. I'm excited to get to wear this, you know, in 2025 when I finally get it done. I'll be excited to wear it. I joke, but you know, there's a little bit of truth to it. I'm not a fast knitter. I look at my stitches almost continuously while I knit. I need to work on that where I can just kind of knit and watch TV without looking down. This I think would be the sweater for that once I've um, put the, the sleeve stitches on hold and I've got just the body and all I'm doing is knitting in the round over and over again. I think it'll be a good a good technique. I did notice when I did my other raglan sweaters that 
by the time you get to the point where you are putting those sleeve stitches on hold and uh, starting to knit the body, you've actually done about a third of the sweater. So once I am kind of keeping that in mind, as I'm doing these increases for the raglan, the number of stitches is getting huge and this is the, the most stitches that I'll have. So it'll feel a bit slower. It always feels a bit slower when doing the yoke of the sweater. And then it tends to pick up when you move to either doing the sleeves or the body. For this, you can see I'm using wooden needles, which I'm a huge fan of metal needles, but neither of the needle kits that I have have these three millimeters needles. So I'm stuck with wooden ones and I'm missing my metal ones. I originally was planning on picking up a pair of metal tips, but like I said, I'm currently on a yarn store the word. Just not going into one for the month of uh, November, I've decided. So wooden needles it is. Good news is, is that I'm going to be working on the sweater for so long that I will eventually get to use metal needles. Just for now, I'll be using these wooden ones. And I've used these wooden ones before. For me, the reason why I'm not as much of a fan is because the points are a lot smaller. So I like the really sharp points because then it, I find it's just easier to get into pick up like knit the stitches it the great thing about wood though is the needles are a lot less slippy i mean the the yarn is less slippy it's interesting how you how you can actually tell the difference in these things i've heard people say that and i'm like oh you know how can that be true but now i'm using it i think now since i've been knitting for long enough you kind of do you just fall in love with the tools that you're using so whatever you get used to and enjoy using you just start liking it more and more so that's the way habits work when you get older you know you kind of find what you like and then you kind of just dig into it it's not that i can't or won't knit with wooden needles it's clearly i am doing that it's just that i prefer a metal needle and everyone is going to prefer different things that's just my my preference so far maybe i'll change my mind when i try a new a new kind of needle so I think that's everything I wanted to say about this project. We'll see if I have more progress to share next time. I don't know. I think I will. But I'm excited to try steaking a cardigan. I have steaked one sweater before, but it was this giant Magic Mountain Cardi that I have by um, Knit Collage. And this will be a lot smaller of a steak. Like the stitches are a lot more regular and there's like going to be way more of them. So I think it'll be quite a big job to steak it because typically you do a crochet reinforcement on either side of the steak. So and there's going to be a million stitches that I'll need to do a crochet reinforcement. Oh one thing I did notice that was interesting is that my in the round swatch did have a different gauge than my back and forth swatch. Which I've heard about happening, but I've never measured the difference between the two. So I did find, I mean, this is also smaller circumference, which people do mention that a smaller circumference has a different uh, swatch um, tension than the swatch, than back and forth. I liked the the back and forth. It, it went, I mean, sorry, the blah, the gauge. <laughs> I ended up just using this gauge, even though I think you're supposed to use something more like this, but I figured since the circumference on this was so small, I'll see how the gauge ends up working out on the sweater once it, it grows a little more. One thing I did notice, which I should have done, and I have read about doing, but I've never done before, is that when you're doing your raglan increases, it's really common to forget to do one. And in fact, I had that exact problem where I didn't have the correct number of stitches between these two markers. And so what I have heard about doing is you actually put between every raglan, you put one more stitch marker that marks the center. Or actually, I think you would could just do it just for, or no, I think it's between every one, you put one in the center. And then that way, when you're going, you're counting after a few rows and you realize you've missed one, you know exactly what side that you've missed because you can count from the center to each point. And then the, the point that has the less stitch, you know that's the side that has the missing raglan. I find that I can read my work. It does take a second and full daylight and staring, um, but I can figure out where I've skipped an increase. It would be faster to just have the stitch marker though. So if you're 
If you haven't heard about that technique, that's something that I was thinking about trying where you kind of, if you're common to forget to do increase, which I certainly am, then that's one technique so that you don't have to kind of search through your work to figure out where the decrease, the missed increase was. I personally don't believe in ripping back. I just sneak in the extra increase when, when necessary. I typically, what I'll do is I'll um, knit doing the increases until it gets to the point where you're doing something different. So in this case, I was um, casting all the stitches to join in the round. And that's when I go through and count and see if I'm off and then I'll sneak in the extra increase on that round where I'm not suiting any increases. So probably the next time I'm gonna check is not until I'm all the way done the entire raglan. I might check earlier, but probably not. And then once I get to that point where I'm taking stitches off for the sleeves or for the body, I'll kind of go through and just see how many increases I'm missing. Realistically, it's probably gonna only maybe be, it might be, you know, one for everything. Maybe it's 10, but 10, 10 stitches is, well, I guess 10 is a fair amount. Five, I think more like five, which is like maybe like a centimeter, which is fine. That's, it'll all resolve itself. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into a bit about what I got at Rhinebeck. So I'll talk one object I've already started making. And then I actually have, yeah, anyways. So we went to Rhinebeck for the first time. I was there with my mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and then my um, aunt. And it was our first, all of our first time. So we flew into Newark airport. I was actually already in the city because I was with my husband for a week before. So they flew into Newark. I met them at the airport and then we rented a car and we drove what should be, I think about an hour and a half drive to Rhinebeck. But the amount of rain that was the rainfall on Friday when we were doing the drive was insane. So we were, I, my mother-in-law was driving and I think she was going half the speed limit because we couldn't, we couldn't see. It, the rain, it was raining so hard that the like, you know, cars nowadays have the automatic eyesight. The eyesight thing alerted that it had turned off because it now couldn't see because the density of the rain was so bad. I don't know, like I rarely see rain like that when driving. It was out of this world. So we, it took us what should have been an hour and a half drive. I think it took us three hours to get from Newark to Rhinebeck. We did stop and have dinner, but it took much longer than we thought. And then the next day we woke up and we headed to this yarn festival. So for those of you that don't know, Rhinebeck is considered, it's like also called the Sheep and Wool Festival. It's kind of the, I believe it's the largest sheep and wool festival in North America. It has, I believe, 30,000 visitors over the weekend. It is massive. There are over 300 vendors. I'm actually gonna do a vlog video about the weekend and that I'm gonna upload a week from when this comes out. So not this Saturday, but the Saturday after that. And that's when I'll kind of show how the details of how the weekend went. But it's overwhelming. It's super fun. They have all the animals there. So I got to see all the sheep. There was, you know, the blue-faced Leicester sheep, the Shetland sheep, alpacas, they got goats, they've got the angora, bunny rabbits. And then of course they have all the food vendors and all the all the vendors themselves. It was it was a lot of fun. We were enjoying ourselves and on that first day, um, a podcaster I like called Mel Make Stuff, she talked about some purchases that she made at Rhinebeck a few years ago. And I saw one of the booths that she mentioned, which was the Green Mountain Spinnery, which is a co-op spinnery. And I believe, I know it's, it's in Vermont. And while I was there, I knew that I wanted to get some yarn. One of the big things I struggle with when I go to a yarn festival is actually purchasing things. I find it very overwhelming, so, so much so that I can't make a purchase. This time I ended up creating this Google Doc, which I'll share uh, in a link below, which had these patterns Then it had based on my size, how much yarn I would need to knit. I'm someone who loves to purchase yarn with a pattern in mind. I don't, I'm not a huge yarn 
collector. I find it gives me stress to have yarn sitting around that I don't know what the project's for rather than joy. I think for some people it gives them joy. For me, it, it for some reason just feels a bit like clutter. So I always like to buy yarn and have a purpose for it in mind. That being said, I do still have a lot of yarn that is sitting in a box. So I'm not, I'm not, not nowhere near perfect. This is just my kind of, this is my aspiration for what I like to do. And then of course the reality is that I sometimes buy yarn with uh, no purpose just because it's so beautiful. And that's, that's okay too. So, and this is what happened with this yarn. So I just kind of saw it and I fell in love. These yarns are a little bit more rustic. Uh, they are definitely non-superwash. And this yarn is their Ragtime, which is a two-ply DK. It's 100% fine wool and it's 100% American grown fiber. And I believe it's, I mean, the sheep are in the US and it's definitely spun in the, sh the US as well. And then, then this is the Coltrane colorway. So to be conservative, I ended up purchasing five skeins of this just so that I could knit basically any sweater that I felt like. Later on when cruising through the sweaters, I realized that this is actually the yarn that's used, uh, was used for the original uh, pressed flowers cardigan. So this was the contrast color that provided the kind of changing of colors in a sort of way that kind of like depth in color because it is two different colors spun together and I do think I will have a bit of striping just because the colors are a little a little different as they go so I bought this spontaneously and then it was my job to try to figure out what the heck I was going to make with it this is the yarn because it is two different colors spun together and then like each ply is a different color and then those two colors in themselves change a little bit. The shade that I got is more of an even. It's definitely a lot more even than some of the other ones which you'll see for the the pressed flower cardigan but there are there is definitely some differences like this I don't know if you're able to see this but this is different than right here. So in my opinion because of that this isn't going to look great in a kind of plain stockinette stitch because you'll get striping, which I'm not a huge fan of striping. So then I started thinking of other patterns that I could knit, possibly the pressed flower cardigan since it is the desired pattern. I would of course need to grab more yarn though because this would have to be the contrast color. And I just for the pressed card cardigan, pressed flower cardigan, I love, it's really beautiful, but I want something a little more fun then this kind of greeny yellow. This to me is a very like rustic color and for that pressed flower cardigan I would just want something kind of bright and cheery and exciting. So I nixed that and then I was thinking about doing the shifty sweater by Andrea Mowry but again I would need to buy more yarn to do that and then finally I was like you know what what if I did an all over cable sweater and so that is what I decided to do. So I ended up, since my gloves were no luck, I ended up casting on and starting um, an all over cable sweater. And I chose a design by Sari Noland. Again, I chose a pullover because that is my style. And as you can see here, it's hers is also kind of in a yellowy color and it's got just this lattice work of cables down the center of the body and then it has cables with bobbles on either side with a I think it's called moss stitch just um, on the insides of the sweaters and on the side. So I was very happy with myself. I was you know found a sweater pattern that I liked. I think I am going to alternate skeins just to avoid any striping that happens just so then the striping is a little more swapped but since I was in New York and I wanted to cast on right away I ended up just hand winding this and then getting getting started on it so this is just the the neck of the design I created here is a gauge swatch this it is a little bit more I would say this is more like cabin cabin chic 
So this is a sweater that I'm planning to walk the dogs on in in Vancouver and go camping in. I won't be wearing it out for dinner. I do think that this pattern itself is absolutely gorgeous. And if knit with a different yarn, could totally be a fancy sweater. It's just because of the yarn that I'm making it in, it is more rustic and more, and just the color, this kind of like mustardy green. I just think it's more suited to more rustic events like being outside in nature and kind of possibly getting a little dirty. I mean, dirt would very, would blend very well with this sweater. So I started it, I got gauge with the sweater, which is great because this yarn can be, they say that you can use this yarn, it's a DK, but it's definitely more of a full DK. They even suggest that you could uh, swap out this yarn for like a super wash worsted weight, just because it is such a full, a full DK. And this sweater has the same technique as the other sweater where you, you go back and forth. So I'm actually at the back and forth stage right now. You go back and forth and then eventually once you do enough for the short rows, you join in the round and then you start. This is also a top down raglan. So there's raglan, there's the four raglan increases. So I'm knitting back and forth to add the short rows and increasing at the front, slowly kind of bring the front together. Then once the short rows are complete, I'll cast on uh, stitches so that I can join in the round join the front and the back, all the while I'm doing the raglan increases and I'll keep doing that before putting the sleeves on hold and then joining in the round for the body. I downloaded this pattern, I've always wanted to do a sari no one design and I absolutely forgot how complicated all over cable patterns are. So my first sweater, which I don't think I've ever mentioned on this podcast, was a sweater by Hohe. Goodness, I don't think I can remember the name of it, but I will put it down here. And it was for my mom and it was an all over cabled sweater. It was a cardigan. It, I realized, I think each round took me about 20 minutes. And when I downloaded the Sari Norland pattern and looked at all the, the charts, I realized how complicated the sweater is. This, I think these sweaters, the all over cable might be more complicated than color work. Because color work, you can, you're just knitting and it's quite easy to read the chart in a lot of ways and kind of, you can almost pick up on the pattern with your eye when you look at a color work chart. Like, you know, if you're making like a heart, you kind of have a general idea of like each heart, what it's going to look like. Whereas with the reading the cables, I find my brain just can't read a cable chart and then figure out what it's supposed to look like. And also with the yarn that I've chosen, it is gonna mask the cables a little bit more just because it does have this, it's, I won't have the same definition of stitches as if I had a solid color when I have got two different colors spun together. It's just gonna um, create less stitch de definition, which wouldn't be like a typical yarn that you would choose for a sweater like this, but that doesn't, I'm, I'm excited to do the cables because the cables will just be a little bit softer and a little bit more subdued because the yarn itself is quite interesting and intricate. And this is how much I got done. I've only been working on this for maybe three, three or four days. This is what I knit on the, the plane ride home since I couldn't, I couldn't knit my little gloves anymore. So I got to cast, cast this on. And this has been a lot of fun, but this is like the exact opposite of the sweater that I showed before where I need to be staring at the chart. I printed out the sweater. Well, I mean, I, I printed them both out. Oh, there it is. And I, that way I can easily flip, flip between all the charts. This is, I would say it can be a TV knit, but it's gotta be a TV show that you don't really wanna pay that, pay that close attention to. So I'm quite excited about this. So I just finished kind of three sweaters in the last few months, and now I've got three sweaters that I'm starting and they've all got different attitudes. So I've got the Sully cardigan that's got a lot of stockinette. Then I've got this, oh, I never even actually said the name of the pattern. So this is, I believe it, it's kind of got an interesting name. It starts with an S. It is the, oh no, it doesn't. It's the Aurelia 
pull over. Uh, by Sorry Nolan. So I've got my all over cable and then I have the all over color work by uh, Marie Wallen, which I haven't started yet, but I have the kit for. I'm going to start that sweater. I mentioned it last episode. I'm going to start it. I decided around Christmas time when I have just a solid block of time to really kind of get started and dive into the process. Speaking of Marie Wallen though, so this is the pillow that I did. And oh, actually, before I jump into this, I'll, I'll keep talking about my the rest of my ride back purchases. So the other thing, the first thing that I actually purchased when we got there and we all got one of these is this cute, adorable little sheet. Uh, what is the word? Ornament. A sheep ornament. It's got this cute little ball, ball on it and the face and the little ears and the little feet, I believe, are... Um, oh, I've lost... I've lost the, the ability to think. Pipe cleaners! And then the body is like a wool. It's like a felt... Uh, felting wool. Roving, I believe it's called. And there are these adorable little sheep and then they have the little a little bell around the neck. So we each got one of these so that we can always think of Ryan Beck. And I was thinking these would be so much fun to make. I think I could easily make maybe 10 of these for the Christmas tree. My dog would absolutely love these though. Dogs love the smell of sheep, which isn't surprising considering dogs and sheep, I feel like are, uh, have coexisted for many, many years. So, I bought that yarn and then I did manage to buy another sweater quantities worth of yarn. And this is something that I've never bought before. So this is Bare Naked Wools by Knit Spot. And this is their Kent Lace. It is a natural undyed wool. And this is the colorway Beach Pebble. And it is a 60% Merino wool and a 40% Romney wool. So as you can see, I've, I've definitely swapped a bit more with these sweaters to moving to more rustic yarns. Like I have the Shetland BFL blend, and then I have the fine wool, whatever sheep blend that is. And then this is actually, I'm going to do a lace weight sweater. So each of these is 750 yards. I abs I saw this booth at Rhinebeck and I just fell in love with their yarn. I was originally planning on doing more of like a worsted weight sweater, but um, this yarn is very luxurious. So I started thinking about typically when you get thinner yarn, you get quite a bit more yardage so you can make a cardigan with quite a bit less. So I decided to really dive into it and go for a lace weight sweater, which I've never done. So this is going to be an all over lace cardigan. So uh, Bare Naked Wools releases their own patterns. And they have got just gorgeous patterns. And when you purchase yarn from them, you get access to their uh, buy one, get one. So I decided that I'm going to do this sweater, which is the, let's see if I can get the name. It's Dandelion Honey. And you can either do a V-neck long sleeve, or they actually also have a crew neck short sleeve. And then it comes in different lengths as well. So there's like a cropped length and then there is a more of a tunic, a tunic length. So it's, it's, it seems like an absolutely wonderful pattern because I mean, for one, it's uh, gorgeous. So you can knit this in either a fingering weight or a lace weight. I'm gonna choose to knit it in a lace weight, which will give it, this is the fingering sample and then this is the lace weight. So the lace weight, of course, will have a little more, um, just a little more holy and a little less uh, dense, the fabric itself. But I think it'll be gorgeous. So I would totally recommend checking them out if you want kind of a more of a textured sweater. They had all their sweaters hanging up and their sweaters looked incredible. They had so many samples and they all looked um, like they didn't have any pills on them. It looked like the yarn was holding up really well, which got me excited, which is why I decided to purchase some of their yarn. And I absolutely loved it. It's, yeah, I'm very excited to knit with this. I got, this is kind of like a warm gray. 
and it feels very soft and it feels a little bit, it seems to me a little bit thicker than other lace weight yarns that I've seen. I mean, I'm typically, whenever I work with a lace weight yarn, it's a mohair, which has quite a bit of a halo, but this doesn't have much of a halo. It's more just kind of, it's a two ply. Uh, it does have that more of a thick, it does have that thick and thin, which I'm excited about, but it feels very full and bouncy and just gorgeous. I do want to cast this on, but I am worried about having four sweaters in progress. We'll see though. It could be one of those things where I want to cast on and then I'll just uh, knit until I, I can't, I can't knit no more. So, so those were my three Rhinebeck purchases. The, um, the two sweater ponies worth the yarn and then the little sheep ornament. And then while I was in New York, I actually picked up some fabric and that is where when I was talking about this Marie Wallen pillow, I ended up buying the backing for this. So I finished this in January of 20, this just this past year, 2023. And I meant to bring this to New York with me so that I would be able to see the colors and pick an appropriate fabric, but I didn't. So I ended up going with this kind of neutral gray, which I think works super well. It's more durable. This is 100% wool. It is actually a double-sided, two-faced, two-faced. Uh, I don't know what it's called. I don't, I know very little about fabric, but it's double-sided, it's woven, so it doesn't have a lot of stretch to it. And it's thick and feels really durable. And it's kind of a bit like, to me, looks like a bit like a tweed. Since they were, this was actually the last of the roll, so they gave me a discount on it. And I've got so much, I could think I could make four pillows and a jacket. Like it's just <laughs> overwhelming. So I'm very excited about this. I kind of want to do this project next month and then buy the pillow for the yarn. I was actually thinking about make, getting custom cloth buttons getting made. So I could do a zipper for the fast, for the back, but I know that you can get custom buttons where the button is the fabric. So I thought buttons could look really pretty for the back of this pillow. I've never sewn with um, a knitted fabric before that I created. And this, I mean, obviously I wanna make sure that this turns out really well. I'll have to find a pattern that fits this ended up being way bigger than what it was supposed to be if I'd gotten gauge. I should have really gone down a needle size. So I'm, I'm planning on quite probably um, actually, you know, sewing the pillow so that you're um, cutting off some of the edge just so that it'll fit properly. But it should be about an 18 inch pillow, which is, which is massive. I believe that's what it was designed for. So I'm very excited because I've always wanted the fabric stores in Vancouver are pretty lacking. So I'm pretty excited that I got this fabric. And then the other fabric that I got while I was in New York, I ended up going to Mood Fabrics, which is the fabric store that's on Project Runway. I don't know if you watched that show, but I did and I loved it. The other thing I got was this gorgeous Italian silk, which I've always wanted to make like a robe or pajamas. So I got this gorgeous 100% silk from Italy. And I can't wait to make a pair of pajamas with this. I'm going to, since I haven't ever knit something that wasn't, um, that was actually meant to be worn with sewing, I'm going to take it easy. I think I'm gonna buy some muslin and first create a muslin version of the object to make sure that I like the way it fits and the way it looks. And then I'm going to, uh, my mother-in-law has some silk that she said I could borrow for practicing, like some leftovers. So then I'll have to practice sewing and cutting silk before I cut into that. And the next thing that I got, as you can see, this month was a bit more of a, um, just same month. And that's how it goes in Yodo Yarn Festival, which is why I'm very excited with all these new goodies. I've got lots of projects to keep me entertained. The weather has officially, I looked at the weather forecast in Vancouver and it's like straight rain for 10 days, which is what we're, what we're known for. 
but that just means that now I'll be inside. So it's great that I've got all these projects uh, to keep me handy. I've got the sewing machine, which I can pull out and start sewing and then all the knitting projects. So this was also a project that I had in October. And that was, I fell in love with Norwegian, old Norwegian ski sweaters. I found them on Instagram and then I found this company called Dale Garn, I believe it is. Yeah, Dale Garn, which is a traditional Norwegian sweater maker. And they made all the sweaters for the Norwegian skiing team, I believe for the Olympics and then all the other world events. And so I came across a couple of their sweaters. So um, Inga Garden, I believe her name is from Knitting Traditions. She made their, I think it's the 1993 Olympic sweater, which is very famous and they're actually remaking it. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous sweater. But I fell in love with a different sweater, which was, one second. These are all over intricate. To do the finding the patterns for these sweaters is what's the impossible part. So I found this book, which actually just came out two years ago, and it includes all the skiing sweaters, not from the Olympics, but from any, um, what's the word? Not from the Olympics, but from like any kind of world skiing event. So this is the sweater that I fell in love with, which is the 1991 um, skiing sweater for some sort of world event in Italy. One thing you might notice is that the book is in Norwegian. <laughs> so all these patterns are in Norwegian. They are not in English. In fact, this entire book is in Norwegian. So it was quite the project trying to um, figure out how to buy this book and have it shipped in Canada. I'll have the link below with this company that I used. Basically, I had to use a Norwegian website to order the book. And there was only one website that I found that actually shipped internationally so that I could um, get the book. And I feel slightly crazy. So this is the color work charts. This is the level of detail that we're dealing with. I don't mind sharing them because there's that's just part of the sweater. Like it's just like pages and pages of chart. This part, of course, I can, I don't need um, the, the English for, but the nice thing is Google Translate has a great app where you can take a picture or something and it'll translate it. I don't know how well the translation will work for knitting. I'm going to, I'm going to find out. So that sweater, I've always wanted to knit a Norwegian ski sweater. I'll include the website that has all the famous Dale Garn sweaters um, the Olympics with this book and this book includes all the ones that aren't in the Olympics. I'll show there's one more other one. The other great thing about this book is it also includes like hat patterns and then patterns for kids as well. So it's not just, I loved this photo. It's so cute. Uh, she's missing her two front or two or three front teeth. Uh, but she's, so it has all the kids sweaters too. So you could really make sweaters for the entire family as well as like hats and socks, and I don't think there's any gloves, which is totally fine, but I've always wanted, this is the other skiing sweater that I loved. So this has a bit of the Fair Isle elements to it where it's got those X's and O's. And this one I believe is the 80s and it looks very 80s, yeah, 89. Look at the colors, the color choices up here. So this is another project that I really would like to do uh, pop definitely in the new year as I've got quite a few projects already going on. So if you are interested in Norwegian skiing patterns, I have found a book that you might want to purchase and I'll give an update with how easy it is to use the Google Translate app. So I'm quite excited about, about this book, adding it to my knitting collection. And then the last thing that I purchased this month is I got the new long way homestead calendar so as you can see back here this is the calendar that i have so each calendar each month is a new photo and then the days of the month and then there's a little fact so this one is the east frisian is a dairy sheep and can 
produce up to three liters of milk a day. And that is definitely a picture of a East Frisian sheep, which is very cute. So I've talked about Longway Homestead before. It is a Canadian company based out of Manitoba. Um, she is the founder, if not, I don't know if there's co-founders or if she's the only founder, but she's done so much for the Canadian wool industry and continues to do so much. She's a huge advocate. So every year, I think this might be the only second year, um, she releases a sheep calendar and basically the calendar is used as a way to fund the hay for all the sheep so they can eat throughout the winter. And in it are these adorable little photos. So when I saw that she'd released the one for 2024, I went ahead and snapped up one just to get, I mean, who doesn't want cute, cute photos of sheep? And then um, I'm a huge fan of all that she does. I also subscribe to their yarn of the month program where you get a new breed of yarn every month or her new, a new yarn, a new a yarn every month from a different sheep breed and all the sheep are from Canada. And I think all the wool is also milled in Canada. I haven't really been talking about that yarn too much over the last few months, but my 12 month subscription ends in December. I started it in January. So in December, maybe I'll do like a recap of all 12 months or maybe I'll do a special video for that. But I love the work she does. So I wanted to support her calendar I think the calendar was $20, I believe. Uh, sh and then I don't know how much shipping would be. I can't remember how much shipping was in Canada. And I don't know how much it would be if you were um, outside of Canada. But I highly recommend it if you are looking for a way to support a farm and are in need of a cute little sheep fill calendar. Well, that marks the end of everything that I wanted to talk about. If you're like me, you can't believe that it's now November 1st or the beginning of November. I'm with you. Just seems like fall has kind of crept up on us. I'm kind of looking forward to though the fall. There seems to be, I mean, I've got a lot of fun, fun projects planned. I hope that you've got some things that you're excited about. I know fall is also the time for all the make-alongs. They kind of all start happening. This is when knitters start ramping up, really kind of working on those things that are on their needles. So I hope you kind of have a great, great November. I hope that if you celebrated Halloween yesterday, you had a good time. We just had a very quiet Halloween. So yeah, thanks so much for stopping by and all the best for the fall and I'll see you in a month. Bye.